It's an ancient prayer from Israel. Psalm 91, scripture version that we call the message. You who sit down in the high God's presence, spend the night in Shaddai's shadow. Say this, God, you're my refuge. I trust in you and I'm safe. That's right. God rescues you from hidden traps, shields you from deadly hazards. Huge, outstretched, divine arms protect you. Under them, you're perfectly safe. God's arms fend off all harm. Fear nothing, not wild wolves in the night, not flying arrows in the day, not disease that prowls through the darkness, not disaster that erupts at high noon. Even though others succumb all around, drop like flies right and left, no harm will even graze you. You'll stand untouched, watch it all from a distance, watch the wicked turn into corpses. Yes, because God's your refuge, the high God, your very own home, evil can't get close to you. Harm can't get through the door. God ordered angels to guard you wherever you go. If you stumble, they'll catch you. Their job is to keep you from falling. You'll walk unharmed among lions and snakes and kick young lions and serpents from the path. If you'll hold on to me for dear life, says God, I'll get you out of any trouble. I'll give you the best of care if you'll only get to know and trust me. Call me and I'll answer. Be at your side at bad times. I'll rescue you, then throw you a party. I'll give you a long life, give you a long drink of salvation. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. This morning we have a second of instant sermons. Um, Hal and I did this earlier in late June, early July. And so I thought it would be fun, we thought it would be fun to continue this week uh, when JT and Ron can chime in uh, with questions. And these are questions that are left over from that earlier, uh, let's get, you know, some questions that you all sent in. So um, some of them may have been asked before, but I don't think, I, I don't think so, I'm not sure. Um, so we'll get started. Um, the first question is, how is the Holy Ghost different from God? <laughs> Would you like to take it? Who wants to take a crack at that? Um, but, let's you see. Want to try a little modalism. Or, yeah. You know, See how radical we can get on this one. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a rabbit hole here. Yeah. Um, uh, the short answer is not different. Um, so the, the Trinity for me and these things aren't very good as doctrines, but they're really great as poems. Yeah. yeah. They're just images for us to engage a mystery. And so you can use the word God, you can use the word the phrase Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, but these are forms of the divine. Um, I suppose you could say Holy Spirit is what moves among us and within us. Yeah. That's one way to play with it. Yeah. Well, and, you know, the, the, the classical formulation, you know, one in essence, a distinct in person. Yeah. And uh, I, I remember in confirmation raising a similar question. I made my minister crazy at that point. Good for you. And uh, I'm always thankful for a kid in confirmation class who makes me crazy or has made me crazy because they're the ones that go into the ministry. Uh, <laughs> they're the kids we're looking for. But, but the, um, the whole idea is that the heretical answer is that they aren't different, <clears throat> but it's... It, that's called modalism, and that was rejected as a, as a heresy by the early church. But I always think that, that 
The Holy Spirit is what animates the follower of Jesus with a continuing presence. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit is that which comes to me in the dark night of my soul as water in the desert. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to get much closer than that. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Because it's mysterious. It it's is. It's supposed to be mysterious. Mm -hmm. It's, it's mystery. It's, it's, it's God among us and working among us. Yes. Yeah. And isn't it hard for us in 21st century, including the choir back here, because I know you're here, um, 21st century technical, scientific, political America to just be able to be satisfied with the answer, it's a mystery. I'm, I'm learning, the older I get, the more I go, not facetiously, but truly, I'm taking more comfort in that, in that question, in that answer, mm -hmm. um, which is an answer and a not answer, but that's another question. Um, <laughs> how do you, and I can't remember, I don't think we did this one earlier. Mm -hmm. Hal and I might have done it a few weeks ago, but how do you share the truth with love and still get the message across? What examples did Jesus show us? Hmm, there's some questions in that question. How do you share the truth with love and still get the message across? What examples did Jesus show us? And so I'm going to interpret, and I want you guys to see where you go with this, the truth as the truth of God's love, the truth of God's ways. There's a big... I could put a big red circle around what is the truth, but mm. how do we share the truth with love and still get the message across? What examples did Jesus show us? <laughs> you need to start. <laughs> yeah, give I'm going to tell a story. Uh, it's dangerous when I tell a story. Uh, the first time I ever preached, uh, really preached, I was in my first year of seminary, and it was during the Vietnam War, and... Uh, I, boy, oh boy, I threw a little bit of everything in that sermon, and I just let them have it. And uh, the much wiser mentor, the, the minister at that church, um, I met with him afterwards, Mr. Gygus. He was a classic New Englander. And um, Ernie just smiled, and he said, you know, Ron, um, the first time I preached, it was in Watertown, and there was a man in the congregation who took me aside after the sermon and said, Mr. Gygus, you should always tell the truth, but you don't have to be telling it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Ernie's way of saying that, yeah, I was telling the truth, but I was doing it in such a way that it didn't affirm the people who were listening to me pontificate and didn't recognize their humanity. Mm -hmm. Or the fact that while we might have disagreed politically, and many in those days many did, we were still all together as followers of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so telling the truth in love is one of the hardest things to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I uh, every time I get driven to my knees in humility, it's usually when I've told too much of the truth. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Without mm -hmm. loving. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the other thing that would add to that would be it's, uh, it takes a lot of self-awareness yeah. and humility to, to know uh, why and to share with people. This is for me what makes an open hand. You offer it with an open hand. You're self-aware of why it's important to you, what's at stake for you, and you stay with you and say, this is what's important to me, and this is what I've seen, and then you just leave it open, yeah. as opposed to um, impressing it upon, making it an oppressive thing. This is the truth, and you must take it in this way. Um, you stay with yourself, knowing your own truth, and then knowing what truth you're connected to. Mm -hmm. That tends to work out better. I have plenty of evidence to the contrary in my life, <laughs> <laughs> trying it other ways. Yeah, we do that a lot and yeah. with the people we're closest to, too, don't we? Indeed, indeed. That's where there's the most at stake. Yeah. So what examples did Jesus show us 
of speaking God's truth in love. Those, all, all of the parables. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you take the parable to heart, it comes up and bites you. But, but yep. I, I, I can't... There, there were a couple times when Jesus was not very Christ-like. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean... What, it, what, what was it, the, the, the Syrophoenician woman? Woman at the well. And the woman, yeah, the woman at the well. It, Jesus just wasn't Jesus at that point. But that woman took on the Christ, the Christa, and became Christ the healer to him. Mm -hmm. And reached down and picked him up with her unconditional love. Mm -hmm. And that, that was one of the examples. Yeah, you know, yeah, when, when yeah. Jesus... Did, Jesus did a little autocorrect or suffered yes. a little autocorrect. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. That's yep. one I can think of. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Yeah. The story, that's, I love that story, the story of the Syrophoenician woman. Yeah. Um, and uh, where Jesus, I don't, if you don't know the story, Jesus, she, uh, she asked him to feel, first of all, she approaches a table, which is supposed to be all men, and she asked, she asked Jesus to heal her daughter. And Jesus says, um, we don't give, what is it? We don't give the crumbs. Yeah, we, we don't, I'm here, to I'm here dogs. To, In other words, food to so dogs. she's a Gentile. I'm here to, to lead the Jews. You're a Gentile. We don't give the crumbs to the food to the dogs under the table. Really kind of weird. Why is Jesus saying this? That's really weird. He must have been having a bad day. Um, and she says, oh, yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs under the table of the food that's dropped, saying, I am a person, and I know that you love God, and you know God, and I know that you can heal my daughter. And Jesus says, for saying that, uh, go and faith your daughter as, as well. And um, I love that story so much that Jesus could learn something from a woman mm -hmm. yeah. that it was in my ordination. Yeah. Yeah, service. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I was thinking of the story of when Jesus speaks to the rich young ruler. Yeah. And he says, you know, what's the most important commandments? Um, well, you follow them. You're a Jew. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Love your neighbor as yourself. Um, but yes, but well, I've done that. What else should I do? Go uh, sell all you have and give it to the poor. Oh. Don't know if I can do that one. You know. And I always, I have two sermon thoughts on that, which is, <laughs> which is helpful to me, because rarely I have more than one thought. But, but, but one, of the th one of the thoughts is that at that point, it wouldn't have mattered what Jesus said. It would have always been one more thing, because right. the way to God is a way of grace. Yeah. And it's, it, it, it's an open way. It's not right. a way with a lot of check marks, things right. you've got to tick off. Right, you know? right. So, um, this is a very direct question. Do you believe in hell? <laughs> For other people, sure. I didn't right. ask it. <laughs> no, no I, I'm sorry, I had to say that. I'm sorry. No. Right. You, what, what? Um, it de once again, you have to be with the person yeah. if, right. if they mean, do I believe in some literal place of eternal punishment? No. Yeah. No, I don't. But I see people create hell all the time. Yeah. In this life, we do it together as a collective. We do it individually in our own internal traps. And so in that sense, I absolutely believe in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, in the other sense, not so much. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And I, uh, somebody said once that hell is being dead and knowing it. Mm. And I, you know, I, I, can get, I can get all wound up on that one. But no, I don't think it's a place either. But I've seen it so often. I've created a little hell for myself mm -hmm. from time to time. Mm -hmm. And with worry and jealousy or anger or all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's a theological, historical... Um, Ideas around this, you can research it. Whole books have been written yes. on where this idea came from, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it's not a biblical idea, uh, but it's 
It's certainly an idea that has taken root in, the, in Western culture over so many yeah. mm -hmm. millennia. Well, it is a way of keeping the poor quiet. You know, the, the Lord's up in the castle eating all the food, and you get, you get the religious authorities to tell the peasants if they don't behave, they're going to go to hell. I mean, that, it, it, there, there's just some pretty foul stuff around that. Right, Yeah. right, right. And we do create, I, I agree with both of you, we do create it for ourselves, don't we? I mean, when we, I was just musing myself the other day about something and thought, wow, uh, you really aren't trusting like you preach. <laughs> you know? Preach to trust God? You're, you're, not, you're not very trusting here. What's going on with you? And that feels like a pretty hellish place. <laughs> My, 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 my six-year-old son once in a children's sermon, and I was talking about love, he said, you know, Dad, you're not very loving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really, son? Let's talk about that. <laughs> so, yeah, I've had some sons that might have said that, too. Um, so we answered this one earlier, but I think it's a good one uh, for uh, this day and age. And a redemptive question in certain ways. Um, so uh, take a stab at it again or, or repeat or have a new revelation. Um, does God intervene in the world today? Yes, no, how? Uh, not enough to my liking. <laughs> yeah. Certainly. So I have that side, uh, but as... I don't, I don't think the question's framed in the way that I would frame it. Intervention isn't quite the word that captures it for me, that there's a divine presence and a sort of process theology way, which I'm sympathetic to. There's a process of life unfolding, and God is always in it. The divine is always in it. And so when more people lean into that, it's going to manifest more. Um, there's certainly a mystery about how it happens. But is there divine activity, and is it making a difference? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think we participate in it. Yeah. And to participate more in it is what heals us yeah. and what makes a difference for the collective as well as each one of us. So I guess part of my answer would be yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah and I, I, uh, I'm trying to remember this this. We were really good at nine. You should have caught us at nine. We had this, we had this one down, down pat. But, but I think that um, I like to think, or as some of the great teachers have said, the arc of the moral universe is bending toward justice. Mm -hmm. But the arc is sometimes long. Um, I have trouble believing in a micromanaging God. And yet... I spent a lot of my childhood in a church that taught that God was a micromanager, that I needed to pray for exactly everything, and if somehow I didn't get what it was, um, I was somehow defective in my prayer life, and I wasn't right with Jesus. And as an adult, uh, as a young adult, I began to reject that and embrace a, embrace a theology that was a little more subtle but I am a pietist, and my piety believes that Christ is with me and that the presence of Jesus is real in my life. And things might not always turn out the way I want them to, but that I'm never left alone. Yeah. I think back, uh, I go back, back in the days when Part of the United Church of Christ tradition required kiddos to memorize a catechism. And the first question in the Heidelberg Catechism is, what is your only comfort in life and death? And the answer, that I belong, body and soul, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And then it goes on from there. And I just, mm -hmm. when I'm at that point, I just remember that I belong. Mm -hmm. That... Right. Mm -hmm. I belong. So, mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. God is an accompanying, yeah. an accompanying God. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and 
I've always taken odd comfort and also resistance, because I, that's the way my brain works, um, in something I read many, many years ago from a spiritual mentor, uh, Madeline L'Engle, who's also a novelist, um, and, but was, a, I think, a lay theologian, really. Um, and she first introduced to me the idea that God might have a greater yes beyond the no's that we experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've hold, I, 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 part of me bristles at that, like, but I want to know everything. <laughs> I want to know how it works. And another part of me takes great comfort in that. Yeah. I think that's what you're saying. We, we belong body and soul to my faithful savior, yeah. Jesus yeah. Christ, yeah. yeah. Question one, Heidelberg Catechism. Wow. Wow, wow. So one of the ways that we accompany one another and that we accompany God and that God accompanies us, even more importantly, is through the tradition of communion in which we celebrate God's presence, Christ's presence among us. So let us now move into that celebration. Amen.